Okay, so let's talk about getting game controllers into Macs and using them in interesting ways, or boring ways, just using game controllers in Macs. I'm going to start by creating a new Macs window. Um, maybe I'll make a camera so we can see what's going on. So I've got here a couple of game controllers. I've got this, it's sort of a cheap USB um, joystick. It is a Logitech Attack 3. I've also got a PlayStation 3 controller. And we're going to look at getting both of these into Max. So, um, the object that we're going to need to get these controllers into Max is the HI object. HI. Um, actually, I'll make that again so we can. HI. HI. So you can see there in the drop down um, menu, it says HI stands for Human Interface device input. Um, in previous versions of Macs, if you're using, I think, Mac 6 and lower, then the object that you're looking for is HID, human interface device. Um, in Mac 7, it's called the HI device. Okay. So there it is, but this isn't very much use. How do we, how do we use this? Well, something that we haven't touched on yet is Accessing help in Max. Max has excellent, excellent, excellent documentation. Um, and it's always there when you need it. You just need to know how to access it. So this is something to remember because you'll use it all the time. Um, anytime you make a Max object, you can hold Alt and click that Max object and it'll bring up help. The help is itself a Max patch. So you can unlock the patch and more importantly, you can Select everything with Command A, copy everything with Command C, close the window with Command W, um, and then paste it into your patch. Right. So here's all this stuff that's telling me all this information about the HI object and ways to use it, um, all the messages that I can send it, and everything's wired up for me um, and ready to go. Um, so let's have a look at some of the things that the HI object can do. Um, or just before I do that, I'll just I'll just demonstrate that you can indeed um, get options for all of these Max objects. Let's uh, have a look at a message box, for example. I'll hold Alt, click on the message box. There's everything you want to know about a message box. You can see it's got even more stuff. It gets quite advanced with scripting and things like that. Don't need to worry about that right now. Um, and yeah, so copying help patches, excellent way to start max patching. Um, so let's have a look at what some of these messages are doing. This info button, if you click it, will output all the information the HI object can see. So over here in the max window, it's telling me I have eight devices attached. Um, it's telling me I've got a PlayStation 3 controller with 304 elements. I've got a keyboard slash trackpad with six elements. Another PlayStation 3 con controller. Maybe I've got another one on somewhere. Um, this a Logitech Attack 3 with 22 elements and on and on and on. So you can see I've got access to my trackpad. I've got access to the keyboard and I've got access to these controllers. Um, good to know. Um, but now we've used it, I don't need that info thing anymore. So I'll get rid of that. Um, menu I do need. Menu is very, very useful. So menu, this message, interacts with this object here. This object's a U menu. I can show you how to make one. I'll say N U menu. There it is. Um, a U menu is a menu that you can populate with information and use it to interact with Macs in different ways. In this case, hitting menu um, talks to the HI object and it says, it looks for all the um, gaming devices that are available and then it sends the correctly formatted message out of its right outlet that you can plug into your U menu to populate it. So you don't need to do any of the messy work. Say I'll bring up the help patch and show you the sort of things you can do with a U menu. So you can say append this, append that, append the other thing and by sending that message you can see you've populated the U menu. So the HI device is sending out a message similar to that saying append PlayStation 
uh, 3D controller, a pen, Apple internal keyboard, trackpad, and you don't want to type all of that out, so um, that's what this menu thing does, this menu message. Very, very useful. Um, okay, so um, that's probably the most important one, really, menu. I'm going to select in my new menu um, uh, object, I'm going to select the Logitech Attack 3, which is this controller here. So that's great. You can see in our Max window, we, it says um, HI, focusing on Logitech Attack 3. Great. So it's found it and it's listening to it. But let's press buttons. Nothing is happening. I'm not seeing anything. Why is this not working? The reason it's not working is because the HI object will only tell you what the controller is doing when you ask for it. And you can ask for it using this, the bang. So if you send it a bang, it tells you everything that happened since you last asked for a bang. So if I press a button and then hit bang again, you can see that something happened since you last asked and it is it was this, this thing happened. We'll get to what that thing is in a second. Um, but that's not terribly convenient, right? We don't want to have to always ask um, the HI object for information about what's going on. We just want it to tell us when we wiggle a stick, we want to hear about it. Um, so HI object has a handy little message you can send it called poll poll. Um, in this case, poll 10 will output the the queue every 10 milliseconds. So every 10 milliseconds it'll look and say, is there anything new that's happened? If there is, then it'll send it out. Great, so let's click that. And now if I wiggle the stick, you can see we're getting information here and I can press the buttons. Great, it's listening. And we don't need to ask to get those messages. So that is excellent. That's a setup. That's all we need. So I can get rid of all this other stuff. Dunk. I can get rid of this bang, I can get rid of these little help messages, I can get rid of this, I can get rid of this, I can even get rid of this, and all of a sudden it's less daunting, it's sort of a useful looking patch. Just neaten it up a little bit. Um, I should mention, I don't think we've covered this yet, the load bang object. What the load bang object does is when your patch is opened, it sends out a bang. So you can use it to initiate things. In this case, when the patch is opened, load bang is going to bang and it's going to send the menu um, command to the HI device, which will populate our U menu. And let's make it send the poll thing as well, or the poll 10 message. So then we don't need to um, click them when we load our patch, it'll just happen automatically. Um, I'm just going to recreate that. Okay. Great. So our patch has become quite a lot simpler. Um, and it's doing everything we need it to do. It is listening to our controller and it's sending information out. Um, so now we can start looking at the sort of information that we're getting out of this controller and how we might use it. Um, I'm going to start by just clicking this trigger and we'll watch what happens. So you can see the messages that are coming out. I'm getting 4-1 when I click the trigger and 4-0 when I let go of the trigger. If I have a look at a different button like this one, here I'm getting 9-1 when I press it, 9-0 when I let go. So you can deduce that 4 in this case is the ID of this button and 1 is its state. So button number four is currently held down because it's a one. Now it's a zero, so button four is um, no longer let down or held down. Um, we've got other kinds of controls here. So this, can, this uh, joystick has a slider. And you'll notice as I push it up all the way to the top, it's saying 17. So that's the ID of this input, ID 17. Is, has a value of 0 and as I pull the slider down you can see it goes to 255 so this slider has a range between 0 and 255 cool um, what about the best bit of this thing the joystick so I'll wiggle around 
Now again, I, I can see I'm getting a stream of inputs, so and these inputs seem to go from 0 to 255, but I'm getting getting two of them. I'm getting um, 15, element 15, or um, control ID 15, and control ID 16 coming in. Um, what that is, is that's the X and Y axis, axis of the uh, joystick. So we'll get into that in just a second. But first, let's look at just getting a button. So I want to access this um, trigger. I am going to just neaten this up a little bit more. I'm going to use our route object again, which we used in the OSC, the introduction to OSC. Um, so I'll say n, create my route object. And now the argument that I want to give this is what it's going to look for, for it to send out the value that I want. So if I press, press this tree, you can see um, what, I'm, what I want from this button or what I want to find is 4, element 4. So I'll say 4, connect this up, and I'll connect a message box to the right outlet of the message box to see what's coming in. And now you can see, when I click the trigger, I get a 1. When I release it, I get a 0. So we've now isolated the uh, the data that we want to use. Let's, let's find another button. So let's find this button on the top. One. I can see in my print window that, that that's button ID 6, so I can simply add that to my route object, 6, create another message box with the key M, join it up to the right of the message box, and now when I click the button on the top, I get a 1, when I let go, I get a 0. So I can now see there's my trigger, there's my button on the top. Cool. So what about some of these analog values, the sliders and the joystick? Um, I'm going to create a new route object. Um, and I'm going to look for the slider. So let's have a look. Slider is value 17. So I'll look for 17. Um, and you might remember that the last outlet of a route object always just passes through things that it, if, it, if there's an argument um, and it finds something, then it captures it and sends out its outlet out of its associated outlet. But if it, it doesn't have an argument for some piece of information that's come in, it just sends it straight out. So we can see that here. If I join a message box up to the last outlet, here are all the buttons and things that we're not looking for in that route object. So there's 9, there's 10, there's my slider that I'm about to look for, 17. But if I hit the trigger, you notice it doesn't do anything because it's capturing that in the in the route object. But everything that it's not capturing, it'll send straight out. So I'm going to chain this route object together with my new route object. And here I'm going to look for some analog values. In this case, I'm looking for my slider. And there it is. So I move my slider up and move my slider down. So I've isolated that value. Now what about our joystick? So if I wiggle this around I can see in my print window I'm getting 15 and 16, these IDs 15 and 16, so let's plonk them into our route object, uh, 15, 16, and we can figure out what they're doing here. So um, I'll create a couple more message boxes, join them to 15 and 16. Alright, and if I start wiggling this around you can see I'm getting information in. So let's try and figure out which one's which. What I'll do is I'll keep the joystick um, more or less centered and I'll move it along its x-axis and we can see what happens. So you can see if I move the joystick all the way to my left, the value is 0 um, from outlet 15 or from control ID 15. If I move it all, to the, all the way to the right, it goes to 255. And the other value coming out of uh, control ID 16 is it's wiggling around a little bit, but it's more or less staying the same. So we can pretty um, safely deduce that the um, control ID 15 um, is the x axis. And we can therefore again safely deduce that uh, moving the joystick forward and back on our y axis or z axis, whatever you want to call it. Um, is coming out of this outlet here, which is 
um, control ID 16. Great. So we now know we have our, oops, wrong thing. We have our slider here. We've got our x axis. I'll call them x and y because that makes sense to me. And we've got our y axis. And then here we've got, up here we've got our trigger. And our um, top button. Great. So from here, I'd probably look at converting these into OSC messages, sending them onto another application on another machine or on this machine. Um, I might do that quickly just to demonstrate another little object called the scale object. Um, first, I'll start by creating um, some OSC, formatting these messages in a sort of OSC friendly way using our prepend object. And I'll give them an address, let's call it controller, um, button, and then trigger. I'll just hook trigger up to this. And then I'll create another one, and this will be controller, button, uh, top. And I'll connect this up to this. Delete these. Um, and then let's make let's send this out as OSC. So I need the UDP object. I'll say UDP send. And I'm gonna, I don't know where I want to send it. I just want to send it anywhere that'll accept it. So I'm gonna use broadcast. I'm gonna say 255.255.255.255. That'll send to any computer on the network. Doesn't always work, but it works a lot of the time. And I'll send it to the port 5050. Um, I'll plug these in here. Uh, and now to sort of emulate another program running somewhere else, I'll just create a new Max window. And uh, I'll make a UDP receive. Let's listen to port 5050. And let's see what's coming in here. All right, so I can click the trigger. And you can see over here, this is just sent over OSC to another patch. And it's come in as controller button trigger one. And if I press the button on the top, controller button top one. Great. Um, and of course, this could be another Max patch running on another machine. It could be, um, you know, you could be sending to Touch OSC to control some feedback on Touch OSC on a mobile device. You could be controlling a VJ program or an audio program on another computer or your own computer. Um, this is just an example of seeing that the data is being received somewhere else. Okay, so there's our buttons coming in. Let's get our slider in. So here's my slider. We need to format this message. So again, I'll use the prepend object, let's say n prepend, um, we'll say slash controller slash uh, uh, analog um, slash slide. Cool. And uh, then send that on to UDP. So it's sending, over U sending OSC over UDP. I'll wiggle my slider, and you can see my slider's coming in there as well. How easy was that? Um, but, you might remember from the introduction to OSC, when we're working with OSC, we tend to like to work with normalized values. Normalized values being a float from between 0.0, .0 and 1.0. In this case, we're getting whole numbers, so an integer, between 0 and 255. That's not what we want. Um, how do we deal with this? Well, we're going to use what's called the scale object. It's not just called it, it is the scale object. I'll say n uh, scale. All right. So what the scale object can do for us, uh, let's have a look at what we're getting in and what we want to send. I'll say, so what we're um, getting in as data is, a, is an integer between 0 and 255. Um, when in fact, what we want, what we want to be sending out is a float from between 0 and uh, 1, 0, 0 0.0 and 1.0. Scale takes exactly these arguments. 
you tell it what range is coming in and what range you want out. That's it. So in this case, we're receiving a range between 0 and 255, and we want to send out a range between 0, 0.0 and 1.0. Now it's important here that you include this decimal point, you say 0, 0.0 and 1.0, because if you don't, then it's going to try and send out an integer. And the only two integers there are 0 and 1, so it'll just send a 0 when it's down the bottom and a 1 up when, when it's up the top. Not very useful. So it's important to keep that decimal point in there to tell scale that you want a float output. Um, let's plug this into here. So this is uh, coming straight out of our uh, game controller. And let's have a look at what it's done. I'll move my slider. And there you go. So you can see it's taken, if we compare it, it's taken our value that was, when it's 255, it's now 1. As we push the slider up, it was 0, is now 0, 0.0, a float, but still 0. So it's going from 0 to 1. Great. Let's plug that into our analog slider. And wiggle it. And there we go. So we're getting a nicely formatted... Um, OSC message uh, with a normalized value. But, 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 there's a quirk. So you'll notice on this slider, for some reason, when I push it all the way down to the bottom, it's 1, and when I push it all the way up to the top, it's 0. That's not very intuitive to me. I'd imagine that when I push this all the way up to the top, that's 1, and when I pull it all the way down, then that's 0. So Let's use the scale object to try and deal with that. Um, again, if we have a look at what's coming in, we're getting in 0 to 255. And we want to turn this into 0, 0.0 to uh, 1.0. Now, remember the scale object just takes any range, any range of numbers, and turns it into any other range of numbers. So here, when it's 0, it's sending out 0, and when it's 255, it's 1. But what if we did this? When it's 255, we send out 0, and when it's uh, 0, we send out 1. Just by swapping these two values, 255 and 0, we can essentially reverse the output. So if we have a look now, I'll push the slider up. Slider's all the way up, now it's all the way up to 1 push it all the way down, now it's all the way down to zero. So that's a very useful um, sort of little feature of scale, to be able to um, map one input range to another output range and invert that range if you need to, um, do all sorts of stuff. I'm going to create another couple of scale objects just to wrap this patch up. Um, and uh, I'll scale both my x and my y value to get them into a normalized value range, because you remember my, uh, if you can still see in the print window that my uh, controller, my joystick gives out values up to 255. So it's sending out the same range as the slider. Um, and 0 to 255 as integers is what you'll see most of the time in game controllers. That's just what they do. Um, so I'll scale these, I'll make some uh, prepend objects to create some OSC addresses and um, we'll call this analog x, analog y, hook them up and hook them up to my UDP object and I can now send my joystick over OSC to another application or just deal with it in Max or whatever. So there you go. Great. Um, excellent, excellent. So that's working with this controller. And what's great about this controller, this joystick, is it's quite simple. Um, it's got some buttons and a few potentiometers for analog values. And that's it. Very, very simple. There are other controllers like this that have a little bit more going on. Um, the PlayStation 3 controller has a tilt sensor, a very good tilt sensor. Um, all the buttons are both digital on and off and pressure sensitive. 
all the buttons except for like these three here, but most of the buttons. You've got two analog joysticks with buttons in them. Heaps of input all packed into this little controller. It can be a very expressive little device. Um, but there's, you can run into a problem when you start working with sort of more interesting controllers like this. And so that's what I'll try and demonstrate now. Um, I'm going to delete all of this. Um, I'm going to delete this. Let me just get rid of the patch. Let's go back to our basic, um, basic patch. So all this is doing is, I wonder if I can maximize this. No. Um, all this patch is doing is reading in a game controller and printing out its what it's received. So let's let's go and have a look for our PlayStation 3 controller. I've just loaded it on, or I uh, selected it in uh, in the uh, HI um, U menu, and you notice all this information coming in. It's relentless. How the hell are we going to sort through all of this? Or what is it? Why is it just sending out garbage like this? It's not garbage. What it is, is the tilt sensors. So if you think about like a joystick, or probably um, easier to talk about a button, buttons only have one state, or two states, on and off. And when you press it, they can say, okay, I just went from off to on, I'm on, or send a non message. When you let go, it will send an off message. Other than that, it doesn't need to do anything. Tilt sensors are a little bit different. Um, either they'll send out their current position constantly, or they'll send out their position um, or their orientation or acceleration or whatever when it changes. But they can be very, very sensitive. So even the, like, I might, I'll try and put this on the, on the table and see if it stops doing things. No, it doesn't stop doing things. And that is because um, slight little variations in the um, information that the tilt sensor is receiving, little vibrations, even just electrical noise, all get interpreted as, hey, we're wiggling around, let's send out some information. Um, so we've got, to, we've got to deal with this. And I should note that it's not just tilt sensors that do this. It is, in fact, joysticks as well. So they can be in their center, and they can sort of be, oh, am I dead center? Am I a little bit to the left? Not really sure. Better keep sending out values just to, just to check. Um, so the way games and, and the way you can deal with it is by creating a dead zone. Um, so you'll say um, if the range is, between, is somewhere near the middle, then don't report any information, and then you don't get that stream of information. But right now, we, we're getting all this information in. It, it's making it really hard for us to tell what button ID is what when we press it. Like, okay, I'll press the PlayStation button. Was that, wh where was that? Was that 69? Was that... 65, was that 30? Don't know, too hard to tell. Um, so we need a way to sort of ignore a lot of these values. Um, we can use the route object to do this. So you'll remember that the route object will take arguments. Um, so I'll just pull some numbers out of here. So like 27, um, 69, 65, 65. Now remember the route object, if it sees any input matching these arguments, it'll capture it and it'll give you the um, relevant um, or associated information out of the relevant outlet. If it doesn't have an argument for a piece of data, if a piece of data comes in it doesn't have an argument for it, it's not looking for it, it just spits it straight out of its outlet. So what we can use the route object for is not just isolating um, information to look at it, but we can isolate information to ignore it. So um, I'm going to connect this. Uh, you, you'll notice if you look very carefully in my um, Max window, I'm getting a stream of information. There was a 27 that just went past. Uh, there's a 69, there's a 65. Right, lots of different numbers coming through. Um, but if I connect my print object now to the last outlet of my route object, it's not going to send out values associated to 27, 69, or 65 anymore. I'm still getting other ones. There was a 30. So let's uh, filter out 30. Um, actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to hit, uh, I'm going to send the HI object a message of poll zero to stop telling me stuff. 
Oops. My bad. Pull again. But we'll pull zero. Okay. So now we've got a snapshot. We can start looking at some of these numbers that we want to get rid of. So uh, let's start from the top. There's 67, 63, um, 29, 63, 67, 63, 29, 67, 28. Um, what else can we see? That's all for the moment. So let's uh, get rid of them. Turn polling back on. Right, it stopped, more or less, but it's still doing stuff. Um, especially if I wiggle it, but if I hold it still, it does stop, that's nice. But let's get rid of these one, other ones as well. So um, there's a 62, I'll stop pulling again. There's a, a 60, 64, 68, 62. Um, so 54, but I'm not quite sure what that is. I'll leave that there for the moment. Let's start polling again. 66, if I wiggle it, I get a 66. So let's add 66. Give it a good wiggle. All right. Okay, cool. So now I'm still getting, what's that, 26, but that could be a, I reckon, I reckon 26, there we go, 26 is the uh, the x-axis of the left joystick, it seems. And you'll notice, if I wiggle the controller, you can see I'm getting some output, so we can deal with that later. I'm going to filter that out for the moment. 26. And now, I can wiggle as much as I want, and... Oh! There is some more information. What's that? 122, 123. I think that's a... Uh, like a mercury switch or something, some sort of more digital thing. So we want to get rid of them. 122, 123. 122, 123. Oh, actually, nope, my bad. I reckon I had the print connected to the wrong out. Possibly, let's see. But oh well, I think we've, uh, I might just get rid of them. Let's call that a mistake. Okay, yeah, it looks cool. I think we've got it. Oh, oh, what are you? Buttons. Probably buttons. Great. Um, okay, so from here, the process is exactly the same as it was with the other controller. Like, let's, uh, let's get a... Let's look for this PlayStation button first. So this one in the middle. You can see that's uh, 23, ID 23. So let's use our route object. And route, let's look for 23. Plonk. Make a message box to have a look at it. There's my PlayStation button. And you can see it's a digital button, it's just 0 to 1. Um, let's look for another one. Let's have a look at the circle button. So I'm going to uh, Start pressing the circle button, and remember all these buttons are pressure sensitive, so let's have a look at what happens. Alright, so I've got 44. As I get to the bottom, I've got 20. So I'm going to uh, isolate them. I'm going to say route out 44 and 20, and let's have a look at what they're doing. I'll create some message boxes. Press my circle button again. Ah! Okay, so you can see that this value, 44, if it matches 44, that I'm getting a value. As I press the button harder, it gets up to 255, just like our joystick. If I release it, it goes down to zero. And you'll see that 20 is working with the um, circle as well, but it's just one and zero, so it's digital. Um, these buttons both give a digital 0 to 1 value as well as an analog value between 0 and 255. All the buttons do it. It's awesome. It is so awesome. These controllers become really, really expressive. You can hold them in one hand and you've got control over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 parameters, maybe another 2, plus a click, plus all the tilt 
that you can get out of it. Um, really, really great. But word of warning: the um, the unofficial knockoff PlayStation controllers can have all sorts of problems. So, um, so if you're going to try a PlayStation Three controller, then go for the real deal. Um, another awesome thing: they're wireless, right? Bluetooth and wireless. That is just brilliant. You can walk walk around. You can hand it around to people and get interactivity going. Um, PlayStation Four controllers look really great as well, but the drivers aren't quite there, so the tra you don't get all the values from the trackpad. Um, there are a few other limitations in there as well. Um, so these are the ones to play. I, I just love these things. Um, yeah. All right, so um, I think that probably covers enough, you know, looking at where we'd go from here with this controller. Again, we've got these values coming in from 0 to 255. We'd want to scale them. We'd want to give them an OSC address and send them out over OSC. Um, the other things that we'd want to do, we'd want to start having a look at some of these values. So here's value 65. We'd want to figure out which axis that's related to. Let's try and make it... Oh, so it looks like that's this, right? So then we can... Kind of, let's just hook a slider up to it and check out what's going on. Slider. Um, information. Uh, uh, we want to go to 255. Um, maybe that's what it's related to. Ah, that's interesting. Yeah, you need to play around. Um, and just you know, hook these sliders up to different things. See what this one's related to. Not even sure. Maybe nothing. Here's another one. Figure out what axis that's related to. It's doing something. But it's all sort of trial and error and just deduction and um, playing around and seeing what you can get out of the controller. Tilt sensors in these are great. Really fun to play around with. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it there.